بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I want to start off by first congratulating our dear friend Dr. Sayyid Ammar Nakshawani uh, for taking the bold step that he has finally taken. Trying to understand why we believe what we believe can be an extremely daunting task for many. The idea that what we were taught growing up is not immune to intellectual scrutiny is a very difficult idea for many to accept. So I do want to congratulate Dr. Ammar for taking this bold step. Albeit, the month of Ramadan is probably not the best month to start a 30-part polemical series. But hey, let's start off by recognizing the good, right? Unfortunately, the congratulatory remarks end there. When I first heard about the Ammar Nakshawani polemical series, for whatever reason, I thought that we would finally see something new from the Twelver side. They are bringing out their big guns. So we might finally see an end to the monotonous cycle of recycled trash arguments that the Twelver camp has been trying to fool people with for the past 900 or so years. Boy, was I wrong. Not only have the arguments been anything but novel, they're actually on the mid to lower end of what I would expect to see in an amateur Discord debate. I want to really drive this point home to our viewers. Literally every single point that Ammar Nakshawani brings has been responded to in the past, either on the Sunnah Discourse YouTube channel or on the 12 Shia.net website. Let's begin, Bismillah. So Ammar Nakshawani's video is comprised of three parts. Um, I quote verbatim, point number one. Virtually every single Sunni in the world Every single Sunni Muslim in the world from a young age is taught that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam left behind for the Muslim community two weighty things, the Qur'an and his Sunnah. This line, I leave behind for you the Qur'an and my Sunnah, is a line that could be heard in Friday prayers around the world. Wherever you go around the world, you'll always hear the Imam of any mosque, be you in the UK, be you in the States, be you in Saudi Arabia, be you, for example, in North or West Africa, you will hear the Imam telling the people that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said that I leave behind for you the Qur'an and my Sunnah. So this is the first argument uh, that uh, comprises Hamar Shawani's video that I will be responding to today, inshallah. The second argument is, of course, Hadith al-Thaqalain uh, in Jami'at al-Tirmati. Um, and the third is Hadith al-Thaqalain uh, in Sahih Muslim. And for the last two, of course, he gives uh, Sharh Hamar Shawani for these ahadith. I plan to address every single argument that Ammar Nakshawani brought in his video. But unlike Ammar, I'm confident enough in the strength of my arguments that I do not intend on hiding behind an inanimate camera. I extend an open invitation to Dr. Ammar if you feel that I have not adequately dismantled any one of the arguments that you brought forth in the video. Please, I invite you to the debate stage where we can scrutinize my arguments and my responses together. Regarding this topic, but also for you Ammar, a special offer for any of the videos that you've made in the 30-part series that you started this Ramadan. Let's debate any one of them. So, Ammar, what do you say? Shall we meet on the debate stage and let the audience decide who, between the two of us, is appealing to weak hadith, appealing to logical fallacies, trying to mislead the viewers? Or will you continue to peddle the same lies from the safety of your studio? Let me know, inshallah. I look forward to hearing your response. Let's begin. Virtually every single Sunni in the world every single Sunni Muslim in the world from a young age is taught that the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi left behind for the Muslim community two weighty things, the Quran and his Sunnah. This line, I leave behind for you the Quran and my Sunnah, is a line that could be heard in Friday prayers all around the world. Wherever you go around the world, you'll always hear the Imam of any mosque, be you in the UK, be you in the States, be you in Saudi Arabia, be you, for example, in North or West Africa, you will hear the Imam telling the people that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said that I leave behind for you the Quran and my Sunnah. So, first of all, Ammar actually presents zero evidence for this claim that Sunnis are prolifically citing this hadith. Allegedly, this hadith is cited in every Jum'ah khutbah in every Sunni Muslim country across the globe. My knee-jerk reaction was to simply call out Ammar al-Shawani and challenge his anecdotal evidence by supplying my own anecdotal evidence. I've attended well over a thousand Jum'ah khutbahs in my life, and only once can I recall hearing the Kitabullah wa Sunnati variant of the hadith. And actually, for that khutbah, I did end up speaking to the khatib afterwards about it. But it's easy to make claims. I made a claim, Ammar made a claim. Whose claim is correct? Claims should be backed by evidence, yes? So let's do that. Even if Ammar 
failed to provide a single piece of evidence for his claim. We are Ahlul Sunnah. We can do better than that, inshallah. We are people of evidence. Bismillah. So luckily for us, there's actually a way to verify Ammar's claims. Um, in certain Muslim countries, the Friday khutbahs are prepared by a central authority. That khutbah is then given in every mosque around the jurisdiction of that government. And these khutbahs are actually publicized on their websites and available for browsing. One such example is the state of Abu Dhabi. In other words, we have a data set and a hypothesis. And again, luckily, I know how to use a computer. And computers are actually very good at processing large data sets. I know, shocker. So I actually wrote a script uh, to analyze every single Jumu'ah khutbah given in Abu Dhabi in the last 10 years and identify any khutbahs that made any mention of this Hadith al-Thaqalain. If Ammar's claim is true, then this weaker version of Hadith al-Thaqalain should be mentioned at least once a month, maybe twice a year, something like that. I mean, that's certainly an underestimate considering what Ammar's words are with regards to how prolific this hadith is in Sunni circles, right? Let's take a look. Bismillah. Then why is every Mawlana in the Sunni world adamant on telling the people that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said, إِنِّي تَارِكٌ فِيكُمْ أَثَّقَلَيْنِ وَخَلِيفَتَيْنِ كِتَابَ اللَّهُ وَالسُنَّةِ Why is it that whenever you hear a Jum'ah khutbah, whenever you hear anyone doing da'wah or doing tabligh or giving a lecture, you'll always hear them emphasizing a hadith that cannot be found in the Sahih al-Sitta. Now, so I've actually gone ahead and downloaded, um, like I said, every single Friday khutbah uh, in the last 10 years that was given in Abu Dhabi. Um, we see khutbahs as recent as literally six days ago um so uh the 15th of march 2024 um going back all the way to 2014 and beyond and earlier um so and i've also written a script uh that will give me the ability to uh search through all of these khutbas for uh, keywords and so what we're trying to do is identify instances of hadith al thaqalain um, so that we can sort of test Ammar's theory and my theory to find out you know are Sunnis actually very prolifically uh, citing hadith al thaqalain one and two um, when they do cite it are they you know doing tahrif of the narration or are they uh, citing weaker variants of the hadith um, so let's put that theory to the test um, so we can search for instances of Thaqalain, weight, you know, weighty, uh, this will catch all of that, uh, heavy, uh, leave behind, leave among. So these are all sort of, um, terms that would be found in instances of Hadith of Thaqalain if it were actually used in any of these sermons. So we can go ahead and run this script and put Ammar's theory to the test, inshallah. Um, okay, so we found a couple of hits already. Again, we're going through 10 years worth of khutbahs, parsing the PDFs. It's gonna take a little bit of time. Okay, so here we go. We actually found one instance of Hadith al-Thaqalain on the 29th of May, 2015. Um, so all these are, you know, they have, we have keywords for weight, uh, but these are not Hadith al-Thaqalain. This one is Hadith al-Thaqalain. Okay, so it's done. And um, every hit of any of those keywords um, has been compiled. And basically there's only one where so the way that it's formatted is like you have the keyword that was hit and then like some context um, and from what it appears there's only one hit of anything that resembles hadith al-thaqalain right so but i'm leaving among you 280 things the one being the book of allah and this was on the 29th of may 2015 uh, every other hit seems to be not relevant to what we're looking for you can double check what i'm saying um i'll put the code up on github and you can search through the this sort of data set uh, to prove me wrong. Uh, I, I challenge you to do that actually, in fact. Um,
But anyways, let's go ahead and open up the khutbah uh, on the 29th of May 2015 to see if, if Ammar is right. So we have so far one hit of Hadith al-Thakhalin. Let's see if the Sunnis, these Nasabi Bakris, are um, citing the weaker variant. Okay, so this is the khutbah that was given on uh, the 29th of May 2015. As you can see up here, um, and its title is On the Virtues of the Mothers of the Believers. And I believe the key word that we had found was weight. So let's look for instances of weight in here. Okay, here we go. So we found it. So um, this is the hadith itself. Uh, oh, people, I'm a human being. I'm about to receive a messenger, the angel of death. Yep, sounds familiar. From my Lord and I, in response to Allah's call, would bid goodbye to you, but I'm leaving among you two weighty things. Yep, sounds like hadith al the one being the Book of Allah, in which there is right guidance and light, so hold fast to the Book of Allah and adhere to it. And then said, the second are the... So remember, Ammar is saying that Sunnis always cite Hadith al So far, we've been able to find one. In the past 10 years, we've been able to find one instance of Hadith al being cited. And Ammar also says that whenever Sunnis cite it, they always cite the weaker variant. So let's actually put that theory to the test. If, if the next thing that comes after, you know, the second weighty thing is Sunnati, then, then Ammar is right. And then said, and the second are the members of my household. Wow. Wow. Ahli bayti. Wow. Okay, well, <clears throat> not sure what to make of that, uh, Ammar. Perhaps, you know, maybe there's some taqiyya going on. Maybe, you know, the python is doing taqiyya. Um, Why do you lie to the people? Ya Habibi, wallah, you have a day of judgment. Wallah, you have a day of judgment. Allah made this religion so clear. Um, but there's also another wording. Um, I remind you of Allah. So if we open up the script again and add that keyword, perhaps we'll find uh, something else. Um, so we can remove some of these other keywords and replace them potentially with uh, remind you of Allah and it's case insensitive so we're good there um, and let's run that as well let's actually clear this Python 3 script let's let that run okay so we found another hit here um, this one is on 17 uh, the 17th of November 2023. So actually kind of recent. Um, we'll check that out. Uh, okay, so it's done. Um, let's go ahead and check that one out. Uh, if we open that sermon, uh, what we find is, this is actually that sermon, uh, sermon 17-11-2023. Um, remind you. Here we go. Udhakkirakumullah. Fi ahli bayti. So, Again, in the past 10 years, in the past 10 years, Hadith of Thakalain has been cited in the entire city of Abu Dhabi over 500 khutbahs. It's been cited twice. So not in every khutbah as Ammar claims. It's been cited exactly twice. And of those two times, zero, zero. Ammar says every time, anywhere you go from uh, you know Morocco to Indonesia, you'll find every khutbah they cite, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. In the past over 500 khutbahs in the entire state of Abu Dhabi, we have found two instances in which Hadith Thakalain was cited. And of those two, zero, zero, zero say Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. Then why is every Mawlana in the Sunni world adamant on telling the people that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, said, Inni tarikun fikum Thakalain or Khalifatain? Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. But this idea that I leave behind for you, the Quran and my Sunnah, is taught to every child in the Hif school, in the Hadith schools, in the Saturday schools, in the Sunday schools, in the Tablighi schools, in the weekly classes. So out of the over 500 khutbahs that I analyzed and that were given in the state of Abu Dhabi over the past 10 years, Hadith al-Thaqalain was cited exactly twice. Exactly twice. And of those two times, how many times was the Kitab Allah wa Sunnati version mentioned? Zero. 
why do you lie to the people? Ya Habibi, wallah, you have a day of judgment. Wallah, you have a day of judgment. Allah made this religion so clear. Now, moving past the fact that Ammar has lied to you guys, um, and I've demonstrated that in as clear a way as humanly possible, let's move past that. Let's, let's grant Ammar this claim that I've already demonstrated to be false and see where that takes us. Ammar, you ranted about this point for over 20 minutes in your video. What does this point prove for you? Ammar makes it seem like there's this evil Sunni conspiracy around the world to cite this Kitab Allah wa Sunnati Hadith and uh, you know, these khatibs have this malicious intent. What, what exactly, Ammar, what exactly are Sunni khatibs trying to get people to do? What's the conspiracy here? What's the hidden intent, Ammar? They want to make people do what? They want to steal the khums money of the people. They want to take power from the people. They want people to obey them. Ammar, they are literally telling people to follow the Quran and the Sunnah, the Sunnah, the Sunnah of who? The Sunnah of your Prophet and the Sunnah of my Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam. If one seriously believes that Sunni Khatibs around the world have a conspiracy to convince people to follow the Quran and Sunnah out of malicious intent, I would seriously encourage such person to visit the nearest psychiatrist and ask to be tested for paranoid personality disorder or schizophrenia. And that aside, Ammar, in your own video, in your own video, you proved that there's khilaf on the authenticity of the narration. Some will say that it is Kitab Allah wa Sunnati, the book of Allah, and what? And the Sunnah. Some will say that this is not authentic. You could not find it in Bukhari and Muslim. And that's why you'll find that different speakers in the Sunni world have had their disagreements about the authenticity and the reliability of such a statement. Let's please play the first clip where you will find that Sheikh Ar'ur and Sheikh Khamis have a difference of opinion on this monumental tradition. Play the first clip, please. <laughs> ما إن تمسكتم بهما كتاب الله الرواية الصحيحة وسنتي. If somebody believes the hadith to be authentic, how are they at fault for citing it? And for good reason. Despite your desperate attempts to make it seem like the only chain for this hadith or this variant of the hadith, كتاب الله وسنتي appears in the Muwatta of Imam Malik, and that report itself is Mursal, the hadith actually appears in another book, Sunan Al Kabir by Imam Al Bayhaqi, volume 20, page 333. Hadith number 20362. So contrary to what Ammar would like to have his gullible followers believe, the strongest change for this hadith isn't even in Muwatta of Imam Malik. Ya Ammar, how strong of an argument would it be if I found some Mursal report in Bihar al-Anwar that had stronger chains in other books and then I implied to my audience that the report itself is universally weak simply because I found a chain for it in one book? That wouldn't be very honest of me now, would it, Ammar? Lastly, Ammar, I want to ask you a question. What does it even mean if Sunnis do cite a weak report? What is the significance of this? Does this invalidate all of Sunnism? Does this validate Twelverism? Does this prove twelve infallible Imams? Again, suppose that Sunnis always cite this report, which I already demonstrated we don't. And again, suppose that the strongest chain for this report is in the Mu'at of Imam Malik, which I've already disproven as well. Does this invalidate Sunnism? Just because Sunnis like to cite a report which encourages people to follow the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, does this invalidate Sunnism? Ammar, do you believe that we should not follow the sunnah? Yeah, Ammar. How many of your minbar speakers cite weak reports in support of their own claims? Forget minbar speakers. How about you yourself in your own videos? How about the very video that I'm responding to right now? Which is actually a good segue to the response to your second argument in your video. <laughs> you know, uh, speaking of Ammar Naqshamani and citing weak reports, let's move on. All of you can see this important work in front of me over here. What is this work? You all know it very well, my dear brothers and sisters. The Jami' of Tirmidhi. You know, um, when I was watching the video for the first time, uh, and I saw you pulling out Jami' at Tirmidhi, um, I actually couldn't believe it for a second. Like, no way Ammar Naqshimani is going to build up all this hype for this amazing 30-part series. And he's really going to bring the same Thakalain from Tirmidhi that we've already refuted a thousand times. But then I doubted myself for, for like a brief second. I was like, okay, well maybe, maybe Ammar found a report in Tirmidhi that isn't the standard one that they always appeal to. Maybe there's a new report. Maybe there's one that I haven't come across before. And boy, was I wrong, huh? <laughs> Ammar is just that bad. All right, no problem. Let's refute this for the thousand first time. Bismillah. So first of all, contrary to what Ammar would like you to believe. Look what it says here, Sahih. 
the hadith is not sahih. The sahih grading is actually given by Dar es Salaam, not by Imam Tirmidhi, by the way, who actually graded the hadith as Hassan Gharib. Now a free lesson in hadith for Dr. Sayyid Ammar Naqshawani. You know, I should start charging uh, for these free lessons on hadith that I'm giving to all these 12 scholars. First Hassan al layari now Dr. Sayyid Ammar Naqshawani. What's going on, guys? Come on. Anyways, let's begin. Bismillah. Ammar, make sure you're taking notes, huh? We open Kitab Khulasat al Ahkam by Imam al Nawawi. We go to volume 1, page 716. And we find uh, Imam al Nawawi saying, Wal mudallas idha qala an la yahtaj bihi bil ittifaq. And when the mudallas says an, we cannot use this as evidence. And this is known by unanimous consensus. Okay, cool. Surely, if this is known by agreement, then Ammar would not bring a hadith that has an'ana from a mudallis, right? Wrong. Let's take a closer look at the hadith that Ammar brings for us. If you'll notice, we find a man called Al-A'mash in the chain. If we check Kitab Al-Mudallisin by Abu Zu'a Al-Iraqi on page 55, we find that Al-A'mash is famously known for being a mudallis. And back to the hadith. We find Al A'mash is indeed saying An in this chain. Now, this would be sufficient for dismissing this piece of evidence that Ammar has brought, but that wouldn't really do justice to just how weak of an argument Ammar brought. The hadith actually has two chains, both of which go through Al A'mash. That issue aside, one of the chains also goes through a man called Atiyah. If we open Tahrir Taqrib al Tahzib, volume 3, page 20, we find that this guy is both a mudallis and weak fairly ubiquitously known as weak. Such scholars as Ahmad ibn Hanbal, ibn Habban, An nasai Abu Hatim, Abu Dawood, Sufyan al-Thawri have classified this guy as da'if. As for the other chain, which is already rejected because of the tadlis of al-A'mash, it has yet another modellus doing an. We find a narrator by the name of Habib bin Abi Thabit. And this man is the second modellus doing an in this chain. If we go again to Kitab al-Mudallisin, page 39, we find that this guy is Mudallis according to Ibn Hibban. How is that for refutation? Again, the Hadith in Tirmidhi, having problems with it is common knowledge for anyone that has been in Sunni 12 or polemics. So I'm really quite puzzled as to why Ammar decided to use this Hadith. Perhaps Ammar just wanted to be target practice for us or something. But again, for the sake of argument, let's accept this Hadith, which we really don't have to because again, we have already shown that the hadith is very weak. The hadith still does not prove what Ammar wants us to believe. How so? If we open up Gharib al-Hadith by al-Khattabi, which, by the way, this book is basically as good as it gets. The author of khattabi is an early author. He died in the year 388. So we find um, a conversation that goes through this guy called Abu Umar, who is the slave of Shaba. وقال أبو عمر سأل أبو موسى أبو العباس هل بين يفترقان ويتفرقان خلاف؟ So basically, is there a difference between يفترقان and يتفرقان؟ And he answers نعم. Right. قال نعم. أخبرنا ابن العربي عن المفضل قال يقال أفترق بالكلام وتفرق بالأجسام. So what this is saying is that the word iftaraqa applies to uh, splitting or dividing in, in ideas, in words. What tafarraqa is with physical bodies or a physical separation, right? And in the hadith, which one do we find? Do we find uh, this idea of th they will not separate physically or will they will not separate in terms of ideas and agreement, um, words, bil kalam? Is it aftaraqa or is it uh, tafarraqa? Which one is it? Let's go back to the hadith. And sure enough, what do we find? We find that it's yatafarraqa. Yeah? Which again, if the hadith meant that there will not be a separation in ideas or an agreement, I mean, there will be no disagreement between itrati ahli bayti and kitab Allah, then the word to be used would be iftaraqa. But that's not the word that was used. It was tafarraqa, which refers to a physical separation. So again, even if we accept the hadith, which we don't, we do not, we absolutely, the hadith is very weak. 
even if we were to accept it, it still doesn't prove what Ammar wants us to uh, accept from it. By the way, Ammar, it seems like you're struggling to come up with good arguments to attack us with. If you need help finding better arguments against Ahl sunnah just let us know, inshallah, I'm happy to provide. <clears throat> There's stronger chains you could have used, Ammar. At least make it a challenge for us. <laughs> At least make it a challenge for me. We could go on, showing various interpretations of the hadith, which, by the way, cannot be used as evidence due to its weakness anyways. Um, but again, I think we've already made the point clear. Ammar has made so many mistakes in this video that if I were to point out every single one and refute every single one, this video would be over 10 hours long. So out of respect for your time, uh, I'm going to try to make this video as short as possible. Regarding the Tirmidhi hadith, I'll leave it at what I've provided already, which is much more than sufficient for refuting Ammar's point. Let's move on, inshallah, on to the final argument dropped by Dr. Sayyid Ammar al-Akshawani. The famous Sahih Muslim 2408. That you know what, Tirmidhi, I'm not sure to tell you the truth about Tirmidhi. I prefer... Yes, I know Tirmidhi is one of the six Sahihs, but I prefer that we hold on to Bukhari and Muslim are much higher than the others. Okay, so let's go to Sahih Muslim. Let's see Hadith al-Thaqalayn in Sahih Muslim. So let's uh, go ahead and skip uh, Ammar's time-wasting tactic of reading out the tedious details of the publication and the dates and the authors and, and get to the Hadith itself. So this Hadith is actually the strongest variant of Hadith al-Thaqalayn. It is a variant that was actually cited in the khutbahs that I showed previously. Remember? So um, this is the Hadith itself. Uh, oh people, I'm a human being. I'm about to receive a messenger, the angel of death. Yep, sounds familiar. From my Lord and I, in response to Allah's call, would bid goodbye to you, but I'm leaving among you two weighty things. Yep, sounds like Hadith al-Thaqalayn. The one being the Book of Allah, in which there is right guidance and light. The Sunni, Mawlana, or Shaykh, or Imam. Be proud to come out and just say, every Friday, wherever you give a lecture, the Prophet said, I leave behind the Quran and my Ahl al-Bayt. Say it. Say it. Let the people know. Don't hide. Say it. Let's go back. Okay, so which hadith is it exactly that you want us to say? Um, remind you. Here we go. Zakirakum Allah. Fi ahli bayti. Yes, they are his wives. They're members of his house. But not the ones I'm telling you to hold on to. The ones I'm telling you to hold on to are the Sadat of the Sadat who are the continuation of the Noor of Allah on earth. Let's go back, please. So I want to pause here for just a second and speculate as to why Ammar is being dishonest here yet again. Yeah, Ammar, why do you do this, Ammar? Do you think we wouldn't notice or you're just trying to pull a fast one? Or you think we're all stupid? What is it? Yeah, Ammar, why do you lie to the people, Ammar? Wallah, there's a day of judgment. Wallah, there's a qiyama, huh? <laughs> Why do you lie to the people? Ya Habibi, wallah, you have a day of judgment. Wallah, you have a day of judgment. Allah made this religion so clear. Ammar, you yourself with your own lips, with your own tongue, read it out just a few seconds ago. And the people of my household, I remind you of Allah with regard to the people of my household. I remind you of Allah with regard to the people of my household. I remind you of Allah with regard to the people of my household. Look how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa repeated three times. I'm on one question for you. One question. Why do you lie to the people? Ya Habibi, wallah, you have a day of judgment. Wallah, you have a day of judgment. Allah made this religion so clear. Ya Ammar, show me where in the hadith it says to hold on to the Ahlul Bayt. Where? Ammar, show me in the hadith that we're citing now. Now we're talking about Sahih Muslim 2408. Show me where in the hadith it says Hold on to Ahlul Bayt. Show me where. Ammar, you're citing a very specific hadith. Huh? We're not talking about Hadith al at large. Muslim 2408, the authentic variant of the hadith. Show me where in the hadith it says to hold on to Ahlul Bayt. Yes, they are his wives, they're members of his house, but not the ones I'm telling you to hold on to. The ones I'm telling you to hold on to are the Sadat of the Sadat, who are the continuation of the nur of Allah on earth. Let's go back, please. So Zayd bin Arqam, radiallahu anhu, makes it clear who he is speaking about. Those for whom sadaqah is prohibited. Ammar, you yourself point out that it's basic fiqh, right? That this broad category uh, includes all the sadat. Yes, you said this. Your wives, of course they're part of your household. But who this Ahlul Bayt are referring to 
is a special dispensation of people. Look what it says. وَلَكِنْ أَهْلُ بَيْتِهِ مَنْ حُرِمَ الصَّدَقَةَ بَعْدَ قَالَ وَمَنْ هُمْ We know that أهل البيت عليهم السلام cannot take that صدقة which is wajib. You all know. All of you are on this basic fiqh. صدقة cannot be given to sadat. So how then do you take this, uh, you know, this giant leap from this hadith is referring to all those for whom the sadaqah is prohibited, you know, the sadat, um, and now all of a sudden, mashallah, tabarakallah, it's referring to the sadat of the sadat. Like, how, how do you get this? Right, the sadat of the sadat, I'm assuming you are referring to as the 12 infallible imams, yes? 14 infallibles. So Ammar, I have a question for you. Do you think your audience is just stupid? Is that how low you think of your audience? Or do you think that they're intoxicated when they're going to watch your videos? What's going on? How do you expect to trick people with this? The ones I'm telling you to hold on to are the Sadat of the Sadat who are the continuation of the Noor of Allah on earth. Let's go back please. Ammar, you said, you're now saying that the Hadith is saying to follow the Sadat of the Sadat. Yes? وَلَكِنْ أَهْلُ بَيْتِهِ مَنْ حُرِمَ الصَّدَقَةَ بَعْدَ All of you are on this basic fiqh. Sadaqah cannot be given to sadaqah. Now the hadith, mashallah, tabarakallah, is talking about holding on to the sadat of the sadat. Huh? You made some, we've made some jump here. We've gone from the sadat, for whom sadaqah is prohibited, to now the sadat of the sadat. How? Allahu alam. The ones I'm telling you to hold on to are the sadat of the sadat, who are the continuation of the nur of Allah on earth. Let's go back, please. Amar, can you show me where in the hadith it says, uh, I'm telling you to hold on to the sadat of the sadat, or the continuation of the nur of Allah on earth? Can you show me, please? If you can show me, inshallah, I'll retract my claim. I'll delete the video. Khalas, yalla, you got me. So Ammar, explain how you're making this jump from sadat, which is what the hadith says, you know, the people for whom uh, sadaqah is prohibited, which is what Ahl Sunnah agree with you on, uh, to now sadat of the sadat, 12 infallible imams, uh, Sajjad Baqir Sadiq Kazim Rida uh, Jawad Hadi Askari. Explain that jump for us, please, because that's the crux of the issue. That's what we Ahl Sunnah have been asking you to do for 1,200 years. Explain this to us, Ya Ammar. Explain to us why we Sunnis should consider Hassan ibn Ali al Askari as a divinely appointed and fallible Imam and not the rest of the progeny of the Prophet. Right? So there's two components to it, right? So one component is interpreting hadith al And in terms of using authentic sources, you've really failed at that because using the authentic variant, which is in Sahih Muslim, you're not really able to interpret it as hold on to or follow blindly or anything like that because that's not what it says. It says, I remind you of Allah with regards to your duties to the Ahl al-Bayt. Yes? The second component that you're also failing at is restricting Ahl al-Bayt now down to 12 divinely appointed and fallible imams. Please, Ammar, please show us if all You don't need to do a 30-part series in Ramadan. Just make one video explaining to me, as a Sunni, why I should consider Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Khalas. Done. Done. You've proven 12 verism, and we can go on our merry way. You don't need to do a 30-part series on Mut'a and Taraweeh and Ghadir and uh, all these other topics that you're trying to go to. Just make one video, Ya Ammar, explaining to me as a Sunni why I should accept Hassan ibn Ali al-Askari as the manifestation of God's lutf on earth. Why I should accept Ali ibn Muhammad al-Hadi as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Why I should accept Muhammad al-Jawad as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Why I should accept Ali ibn Musa Rida as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Why I should accept Musa ibn Ja'far al-Kazim as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Muhammad ibn Ali al-Baqir as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. Ali ibn Hussein al-Sajjad as a divinely appointed and fallible imam. And khalas. That's it. That's it, Ammar. That's it. Really, that's all you need to do. Let me make your job easier. Yeah? Instead of wasting our time and your time in Ramadan when we could be doing taraweeh and instead I have to spend it making refutation videos to you, just make one video and khalas, we all become 12-er. Ammar, you started this video by going on a 20-minute rant. I want the viewers to go back and watch Ammar's video and see how much time he spent ranting about how Ahl Sunnah have distorted the hadith they cite a weaker variant of the hadith, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati, and actually says Kitab Allah wa Ahli Bayti, yada, yada, yada. How much time did you spend belaboring this point, Ya Ammar? And now what are you doing? You're doing the exact same thing, if not worse, actually, because at least the ma'ana you already affirm. 
Ammar, you already affirm that we have to follow Kitabullah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Yeah, But you are doing a sleight of hand. You're doing a dirty tactic because we don't accept 12 divinely appointed and fallible imams. But you're trying to make it seem like the hadith says that we have to follow 12 divinely appointed and fallible imams, which wallahi, wa billahi, wa tallahi it doesn't. And you know this, ya Ammar. Tal Ammar, one question for you. Why are you lying, ya Ammar? Wallahi, there's a day of judgment. Huh? You know this, yes? Why do you lie to the people? Ya Habibi, wallah, you have a day of judgment. Wallah, you have a day of judgment. Allah made this religion so clear. Let's continue, inshallah. The next big brain moment from Dr. Sayyid Ammar Nakhshawani. He said, who are they? He said, they are the family of Ali. The Shia, who do we follow? Who's number one after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? So this is a 300 IQ argument right here. Big brain. Ammar really put in every last brain cell into coming up with this argument. Again, let's. Uh, we've already established that the authentic variant of the hadith, which is the one that we're working with right now, Sahih Muslim 2408, does not say to follow the Ahlul Bayt or to hold on to the Ahlul Bayt. This is the correct wording in the hadith. But let's, again, in the spirit of being generous, it's Ramadan, let's be charitable. Let's give that to Ammar for the sake of argument and see where he's able to take this. Yeah, Are you able to prove 12 verism if we concede this point to you, which we don't? But for the sake of argument, we give it to you out of generosity. The authentic variant does not say to follow the Ahlul Bayt or to hold on to the Ahlul Bayt, but we pretend like it does just to see how far you're able to go with this. So for the sake of argument, we concede. Premise one, the hadith says that we should follow the Ahlul Bayt, we should hold on to the Ahlul Bayt, which is a broad category of people for whom zakat is prohibited or sadaqah is prohibited. Premise two, the Twelvers follow 12 individuals who happen to fall into that category, but do not comprise the entirety of that category. Yes, you guys follow 12 individuals, but Ahlul Bayt, people for whom sadaqah is prohibited, actually comprises hundreds of millions of people. Yes? Conclusion, 12 versions is the truth. How stupid do you think we are? So, in case it hasn't been made clear, Ammar's entire argument is contingent on his being able to equivocate between the Sadat and the Sadat of the Sadat. Yes? He's somehow, using some kind of sleight of hand technique, trying to say, haha, you guys, you guys are, are willing to buy this? Okay, well, I'm going to sell you this, this other thing, right? So, the Hadith says that we should remember our duties. But again, for the sake of argument, we're giving that it says to hold on to or to follow the Ahlul Bayt. Who are the Ahlul Bayt? Again, the hadith is very explicit about this, yes? The people for whom sadaqah is prohibited. Ammar has agreed that sadaqah is prohibited for all sadat, yes? And now Ammar is trying to flip sadat with 12 divinely appointed and fallible imams. I want to illustrate this point uh, in a way that maybe, inshallah, it'll be easier for some of our viewers to understand. Imagine there's a new sect that comes out and they only pray Salat al dhuhr okay? And then they bring to you a hadith which says to pray the five salawat, yes? And they say, huh, your hadith says to pray five salawat. You say yes. They say, we pray dhuhr salah. You say yes. Dhuhr salah is from the five salawat. You say yes. You say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Our sect is the truth. This is exactly what Ammar Naqshawani is trying to sell to you guys. Sunnis already revered the Ahlul Bayt at large. And Ammar is saying to you, we follow 12 individuals who you agree are from that broad category of Ahlul Bayt. You, we say yes. Therefore, our sect is the truth. No, you follow a small subset. You have failed to prove that that subset is who is addressed in this hadith. On to the next big brain Dr. Ammar Naqshawani argument. Bismillah. This hadith of Thaqalain, Kitab Allah wa Itrati. Inni tarikun fikum al Thaqalain, Kitab Allah wa Itrati. Khalifatain. Thaqalain. All of the differences don't mean that it cannot be mutawatir ma'nawi. Yes. Sometimes you have tawatir which is lafdi. Sometimes tawatir which is ma'nawi. I have over here a tawatir which is what? We can all see in the ma'na. Habibi Ammar, you've brought two chains so far. You've brought one in Jami'a Tirmidhi and you've brought one from Sahih Muslim. And now you're already throwing around the word tawatur. What is it with Rafidi scholars and throwing around the word tawatur as if it's candy or something? I don't understand. And it's not just scholars. Even this guy seems to think that two chains all of a sudden becomes tawatur.
Yeah, so the question is for you, how many narrators do we need to have in a specific level for the hadith to be mutawatir? Last time you said two. Are you are you going to take that back? No, no. So according to my opinion, for me, as I said, yeah. this is a subjective thing. So for me, two or more, no problem. But again, we have to look at the chain. We have to look at who the person is narrating it. Is there a context? Does it conflict other narrations? Um, so these are all things that I, I believe that need to be taken. Okay, so so two is mutawatir, um, as long as it doesn't conflict with another uh, another report, for example. Yeah, exactly. So if- I don't I don't know where you guys are getting this from. Can you guys like explain to me where where this may, maybe I missed something? I I don't know where this idea of two chains equals tawatir comes from, but Amman al-Shawani seems to believe it. This guy Bayat al-Khadir seems to believe it. Where is this coming from? Someone says, yeah, yeah, but all these said was, uh, I just remind you, that's what's written in your book. I am not subject to your book. It's not a barometer for me. Only for the sake of discussion am I using it. Ya yeah, Allah. Okay, so the arguments are seeming to get more bizarre and more bizarre as time goes on. Again, let's, let's try to syllogize this argument just so we can rationalize it. I don't want to straw man you, Ammar, but this is quite literally what you're trying to convince us of. Premise one. Sunni hadith says to remember our duties to the Ahlul Bayt. Premise two, this is only in Sunni books. Yes, you guys, 12 verse, have your own variant. Conclusion, Sunnis must now accept the variant that's in your books that we don't accept. How does it make sense, Ya Ammar? Make it make sense for us, please. Please, Ya Ammar. Are you just getting tired towards the end of the video and you're just saying whatever comes to your mind? Ya Ammar, the beginning of your video started with you uh, ranting for 20 minutes about how Sunnis... Uh, appeal to a weaker variant of a hadith, of the same hadith, uh, coincidentally, um, and how this is so evil of them, and there's some, you know, whatever. Uh, but now you're doing the same thing, Ya Ammar. You're doing the same thing. You are appealing to weak variants of the hadith. And mind you, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati, the matin or the ma'ana, is something you affirm and I affirm already. We affirm, you affirm, Ammar, yes? I assume you affirm that we have full Quran and Sunnah. You're not a Quranist, yes? Okay, good. Me too. I also affirm Quran and Sunnah. Whether or not we're able to obtain that from a hadith or from the Quran is besides the point. We already affirmed that. So what's the harm if somebody's appealing to a hadith that has disputed authenticity over this? Ah, but now what you're trying to do with Thaqalain is much worse. Why, Ammar? Because we don't affirm that Ahl al-Bayt refers to 12 divinely appointed Falwiyams. We don't affirm that any authentic hadith from the Prophet ﷺ says to follow the Ahl al-Bayt as divinely appointed infallible Imams. We don't affirm that there's any hadith which says that we have to follow the Sadat of the Sadat for the manifestation of the Nur of Allah on earth. We don't affirm that. But you're trying to equivocate between the two things. He said, who are they? They are the family of Ali. And also in Sahih Muslim it says, the family of Aqil, the family of Ja'far, and the family of Abbas. Someone may turn around and say, so you Shia, why did you stick it only on the family of Ali? Why not the family of Ja'far or the family of Aqil or the family of Abbas? Listen, Muslim in Hajjaj and Nisapuri is writing in the Abbasid period. He must be good to the Abbasid lineage. Otherwise, he's in severe trouble. You could ask Ahmed bin Hanbal about how he felt when he got in trouble with the Abbasids and al Ma'moon. Ya Allah. Okay, Ammar. Um, if I were to submit that last clip alone to the University of Exeter, I'm fairly certain that they would rescind your PhD. I'm going to try to make this as quick as possible. The video has gone on for long enough. Ammar, you've made a claim. That claim needs to be backed by evidence. You understand how that works? The fact that the Abbasids harassed Imam Ahmed does not mean that they were threatening Imam Muslim to alter a hadith or add words to a hadith that weren't there. You're not able to extrapolate that. And let's suppose you're right. Let's suppose that the Abbasids were harassing Imam Muslim, okay? Explain to us, Ammar, explain to us why they also added Aqil, Al Aqil, and Al Ja'far. Explain that to us. And then explain to us as well, uh, Ya Ammar, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, your narrative is that the Abbasids were at odds with the Alids, yes? So why then, if they had so much control over Imam Muslim, and they had control over what he put into his Sahih and what he didn't, why didn't they <laughs> harass him to remove the part about Al Ali? They had the ability to compel him to add Ala Abbas. You believe this, yes? Okay, so why didn't they ask him to remove Ala Ali? Furthermore, by virtue of what, Ya Ammar, is Ali part of Ahlul Bayt? Is it not by his kinship to the Prophet 
via his father, Abu Talib, the fact that he's a paternal cousin of the Prophet wasallam, is not Abbas closer in relationship to the Prophet wasallam than Ali radiallahu anhu. Therefore, there is no way that you're going to include Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu in the Ahlul Bayt, but not include Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu. It just doesn't make any sense. If Ali is in the Ahlul Bayt by virtue of kinship, then Al-Abbas is in the Ahlul Bayt by virtue of kinship, right? So just like Abu Talib is the paternal uncle of the Prophet wasallam. Abbas is the paternal uncle of the Prophet That's the reason why he's in the Hadith Ammar, not because the Abbas compelled him to do it. And what if we're able to bring you chains that bypass Imam Muslim completely? We're able to find chains from other scholars that include this wording with Al Abbas. We find one such report in Musannaf Abd al-Razaq al-San'ani, who was born actually prior to the rise of the Abbasids and was certainly earlier than Imam Muslim. If we open Musannaf Abd al-Razaq al-San'ani, volume 4, page 362, we find the same report, and this one also includes Ali Abbas. Let's forget my books for just a second, and let's look at your books, Ya Ammar. Let's see if your books include Abbas, Ja'far, and Aqil in the Ahl al-Bayt of the Prophet wasallam and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. There's a book, um, again, I'm not sure what you're aware of and what you aren't <laughs> uh, after this video, Allahu alam, but um, it is called Kitab Sulaim ibn Qais. If you go to Kitab Sulaim ibn Qais, uh, page 216, you'll find the following narration, which includes Abbas, Ja'far, and Aqil as part of the Ahlul Bayt of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Radiallahu anhu. So, Ammar, I want to make some closing remarks, inshallah. It's very easy to put out videos, Ammar. You're putting out videos. I'm putting out videos. You can say whatever you want in your videos. I'm saying what I believe to be the truth. And I don't think I'm playing any games with anyone here. I'm, I'm genuinely portraying the haq as it is. But why don't we do this, Ammar? Why don't you come to the debate stage and have a conversation? Let the viewers see who's lying and who's telling the truth. Why don't you subject yourself and the content you're putting out there and the arguments you're putting out there to criticism. Allah says, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقِّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُقَ Are you afraid that you're upon batil, ya Ammar? If not, then why not come to the discussion table? Let's have a conversation, Ammar. I have some questions for you. Why are you appealing to weak ahadith? Why are you trying to equivocate between the sadat and the sadat of the sadat? Why are you lying about Ahlul Sunnah and saying that we all constantly repeat this weaker variant of the hadith? Why do you make it seem like there are only mursal reports for this Kitabullah wa Sunnati variant when there are actually connected variants of the hadith with disputed authenticity? Ya Ammar, وذكركم الله في أهل بيتي. If this is the wording that's in my books, this is the only wording that's hujja on me. Why are you now telling me that you have a different wording in your books? Habibi, I don't care. The only reason why we're having a conversation is because you're bringing me from my books. I don't care what's in your books. So do your viewers a favor and do something which 12ers have not done for 1,200 years. Come and debate us on the imama of your 12 imams. Bring something new to the table. And let's put the theory of your, quote, Shia followers to the test. Are you going to run with your tail between your legs? Or are you going to confront us and answer the call to debate. وصل الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.